This is our third week, third of four weeks in our series entitled The Beginner's Guide to Predicting Your Future. The Beginner's Guide to Predicting Your Future. So in college, I had a friend, his name was Donnie Collar, and he said, hey, let's go to my house for the weekend. I only live like an hour and a half away from school. And um, I said, well, I've got to get back because i got to work Sunday evening. He said, okay, that's cool. He says, here's what we're going to do. I'll go ahead of you. You follow me, and I'll get you there. You follow me, and I'll get you there. And so I followed him through these back roads and uh, around Philadelphia and into, into Delaware, and we got to his house, and I still remember, you know, this is almost 30 years ago. Holy cow. Okay, I don't even look like I'm 30 years old, but it's, you know, it happens. That's what you are all thinking. I could see it in your eyes. Okay, and we got there, and I remember saying to him, I would have never gotten here without you. We didn't have GPS. Some of you young people, you don't know what a world is like without GPS. We got on our stagecoach. We took the, you know, right? I was like, I would never have gotten here without you. See, we've all followed someone we trusted, right? When we didn't know how to get where we wanted to go. And here's what they said. They, say the, they said the same thing that my friend said to me. They said, just follow me. Just follow me. Because they knew how to get where you wanted to go. And you were convinced that they knew how to get you where you needed to be, where you wanted to go. And here's what happens when you're convinced that they know how to get you where you want to be. Here's what you do. You trust them and you follow them. So this series, over the last couple of weeks, we've built upon this, this premise, this principle, or this prediction. You ready? That direction... Not intention determines our destination. Direction, not intention, determines our destination. And last week we talked about this concept that there's often a disconnect between who we want to be and where we end up. And we said this, we said that everyone has good intentions starting out. We all have good intentions financially and relationally and academically and professionally and marriagely. We made that word up last week, right? We all have these good intentions. I don't ever have anyone come to me and say, Pastor Paul, we want you to marry us because in three years it's going to fall apart. I never have someone come and say to me, Pastor Paul, I just started this new job. I'm not going to put anything away. I'm not going to save. I'm not going to prepare for the future. And I'm just going to fall apart and fizzle out in a couple of years, a couple of months. I'm not going to make. I never have anybody come and say those kind of things to me. Because we all have good intentions with all the elise of our life. And here's what we discovered last week, that intentions are not good predictors, right? Our current behavior is a better predictor than our intentions. In other words, behaviors indicate direction. Your behaviors today, right? If you're like, well, I get up at 10 o'clock and I show up to work late, and, but I'm going to be a business owner someday, right? I'm going to be, I'm going to do, I'm going to end up such and such, and somewhere. Grandparents and parents, you understand this, don't you? Grandparents and parents, they get this in regards to who your kids are dating, right? You understand that the person today is a good indicator of who they're going to be down the road. And so you try to gently nudge your kid, right, either towards them. You're like, this is a good catch. Mary. I still remember, I still remember, honest, this is honest, honest. I still remember my parents had a swing on the front porch. And um, I was sitting on that swing with my dad for whatever reason. And we were just talking. And my dad said to me, he said, if you don't marry Lori, you're an idiot. 
Boy, was he wrong. I mean, no. (laughs) Parents and grandparents understand this. Who that person is today is a better indicator of who they're going to be in the future than their intentions. Our intentions are not a good barometer for our direction. And here's the truth, and this is in your notes. Direction trumps intention every time. Direction trumps intention every time. So last week, we explored the disconnect between our intentions and our directions. Today, today, we're going to focus on our direction. Because direction, not intention, determines our destination. And so specifically today, I want to talk to those of you who already, or today, you are not following Jesus with your whole life. And I want to talk to you about surrendering to his direction, and I want to talk to you about trusting him with your destination. Because direction, not intention, determines destination. And I want to invite those of you who are not following Christ today to follow Jesus. To surrender your life to his destination for your life. In other words, I want to talk to you today about becoming a follower of Jesus. And you may be sitting in your chair and you may be sitting back and you may be wondering, why in the world would you make such a bold invitation? And maybe your backstory is that you grew up in church and you were disappointed. Maybe your parents were Christ followers and somewhere along the way they flaked out and you're like, what happened? This isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I expected. Maybe you asked God for something at some point in your life and you didn't get it. Perhaps you would look back on the story of your life and you are disappointed in the past. And you're wondering, why would you make such a bold invitation? And here's why. Because for 2,000 years, people all over the world And they come from all kinds of backgrounds. They come from various locations. They have been responding to Jesus' invitation to follow him. And so I'm making the invitation today because I've heard so many people say this in in relation to their relationship with Jesus. They said this, I would never be here or I would never have gotten here without you. I would never have gotten here without you. You know, here at Shoreline, one of our favorite days of the year, and we're hoping to be able to do it more than just one day a year, one of the favorite days of the year here at Shoreline Community Church is when we do baptisms. Because it's a celebration that people are saying, I have decided to follow Jesus, and I'm not going back. I have decided that my destination is going to be determined by Christ. I have decided that I'm not just a a, a looker, I'm not just a searcher, I'm not just someone who's standing off from a distance. I'm going to follow Jesus with my whole life, and I'm going to trust him with the destination of my life. And so we get excited about baptisms here on on, uh, uh, once a year here at Shoreline Community Church. And here's what those who are being baptized are essentially, they're saying, they're saying, apart from deciding to follow Jesus, I would not be here without him. I would not be here today if it was not for Jesus. And one of those people, one of my favorite baptisms that I've done, and not that they're not all special, they very, they definitely are, but one of my favorite baptisms over the 10 years that I've been here at Shoreline Community Church was when I had the opportunity to baptize Al and Jane Laprino. I held Jane down for so long, I thought, I, I really thought, no. But the reason it was such a special day for us was because we had walked alongside of Al and Jane as they came to that decision to follow Christ. 
And they had come to Shoreline Community Church at the, at the invitation of someone who attended the church at that time. And they've told the story. And if you've not heard the story, make sure you stop by. They love to tell you their, their story of coming to faith. And it's a great story. Someone invited them, and they were kind of skeptical. But they came, and they said, ah, we'll try it out. We'll see what it's like. And, and the really neat thing, and I called out just to kind of get some of the details again from him this week. And one of the, the things that always stood out to me about Al and Jane's story was they were not in, like, like their marriage wasn't falling apart and they hadn't just lost their jobs and, and there wasn't like, you know, their world was necessarily falling apart. There wasn't any of that. And sometimes that's how people come to faith and they're in kind of a crisis mode and they reach out and they find out that God is exactly who he claims to be even in our tough times and in our tough situations. But that wasn't totally where they were at. They, and they came and they started to check it out and, and Al was definitely skeptical and Jane was as wonderful as Jane always is and, and, um, and they started coming and, and, and the really kind of cool thing about it is you meet Al and Janie, you'd never expect that this would be the Sunday that they crossed the line of faith. We had uh, two WWF wrestlers that were here and they were sharing their story about how they had been at the height of popularity and fame and how there were people all over the world who knew who they were but they had fallen and, and they came to a point where they needed Christ and they shared their story and they asked people if they would come and be followers of Christ and Al and Jane made that decision on that day to become followers of Christ. And so a few months later, um, we were able to have that opportunity to be able to baptize them. And I remember I had tears and they had tears and, and there was a lot of snot and it was just a pretty cool moment. And, and we baptized them and they were so excited about it and we were so excited about it. And I asked Al this this week. I said, Al, how has your life become better because you're serving the Lord? And Al summed it up this way. He said that following Jesus transformed his life. I said, I can't even begin to tell you all the ways and all the places. All I can say is that following Jesus has transformed my life. And here's what I want you to know this morning. That following Jesus will make your life better because it will make you better at life. Following Jesus will make your life better because it will make you better at life. In other words, when you say, I'm all in and I'm going to do it God's way, I'm going to do it Christ's way, I'm going to follow in his steps and I'm not going to try and do it my way, I'm going to trust him with the destination, I'm going to trust him with the course of my life, and I'm going to trust that he ultimately knows where the best place for my life is, and you begin to do it his way rather than your way, life gets better. And that's why my invitation today is to surrender every part of your life to Christ. So as motivation, I want to tell you the story of some of Jesus' most famous followers. And this story is recorded in the book of John by one of Jesus' disciples, John. And John's writing his account of what it was like to follow Jesus for three, three and a half years. And John, John is the first one in the Bible to give us this concept that God is love. And here's why, because he had spent three years with Jesus. And he had decided, and he'd come to the conclusion that Jesus was the embodiment of love. And, and not only was Jesus the embodiment of love, but John became convinced that Jesus was God in a bod. That he was God made flesh, that he was the real deal, that this was God walking among us, that this was God actually uh, eating with us and, and sleeping with us. This was God in a body, in bodily form. And here's what he concluded, that if Jesus personified love and he was God, that God must be love. So here's the story in John chapter 6 that we're going to look at. Jesus has just finished a 5K, right? By that I mean he's fed 5,000 with a couple of loaves and fish from a little boy. Let that sink in. You'll get it, okay? You guys can interact. It's all right. Everybody's quiet, right? And so after his 5K, Jesus cools down by walking across the lake on the water, right? And, and the crowd that Jesus had just fed 
They didn't realize Jesus had gone, and so they start looking for Jesus. They start scouring the earth because they were impressed by what Jesus had done. They were impressed by the fact that he had fed them. And so they, they go searching for Jesus. And while Jesus and the disciples have gone across, the disciples on a boat, Jesus walking across the lake, they get to this area of Caesarea, and, and, the, and, the, and the crowd begins to look for, and they finally find Jesus. And it's one of the first instances in the Bible where they start to refer to him as king. And this is significant because Jesus had just fed them. And what a king did in those days was he would provide bread for the people. So they're calling him king because of what he had done for them and what he had provided for them. It, it, it was a, a political way to get people on your side. I don't know about you, but I love bread, right? That's like one of my weaknesses, that and sweets. If you could put sweets in bread, oh, you know, call that cake. Oh, yeah, right? And so, yeah, everybody's like, oh, I'm hungry now. What happened to those donuts you used to give us, Pastor Paul? I get a reaction from that. We'd call you king if you'd give us donuts again, okay. <laughs> and so, and so, they're there because of what Jesus had given to them. And they call him king. And so they find out where Jesus is at, and they rush there. And we find this story in John chapter 6. So we're going to walk through this story together in John chapter 6, starting with the 25th verse. Look at what it says here. It says, when they found him... On the other side of the lake, they asked him. They asked him. And I paused this there because what this is saying, what we're going to see here is they wanted something from him. And so they did what every kid does when they want something from your parents, right? Remember when you needed a ride to the mall before you could drive? Or you needed, you needed to go, um, you needed some money to go bowling or you wanted some money to go to the, uh, um, the movies or whatever, right? What would you do with your parents, right? You started with a little bit of small talk. Hey, Dad, boy, you look young. You've been working out, right? You started off with a little bit of small talk. And that's what this crowd begins to do with Jesus. They, they tried some small talk. So watch what happens, the rest of this verse. When they found him on the other side of the, la of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi. Now, Rabbi was their kind of way of pumping him up a little bit, right? Like, oh, you important person, teacher. You know, it, it, it indicates that they had respect for him, right? So you've done that, right? Man, mom, you look so young and beautiful, right? And your parents always go, what do you want? Right? Your kids do that. You just feel like, right? R Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus does the exact same thing you would do. No small talk. Okay, what do you want? Just get to the point. What's this going to cost me, right? That's what you say to your kids. How much this time? Where am I driving? Is it in the state? Are we doing anything illegal, right? So you do the same thing Jesus did because Jesus didn't have a lot of time for a small talk. And so Jesus kind of smiles, and he, ah, let's get to the point, right? And he says this, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I, perfor I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. See, Jesus gets right to it. You're not here, you're not here for anything more than more food. You want me to fill your bellies some more. You want more bread. And Jesus says this, you're not here because of the miracles. You're not here because of the signs that I perform. Because miracles are a sign pointing to something new. Jesus' miracles had a point. They were not the point. They were pointing to something. They were a sign. They were a sign pointing to the fact that God's kingdom had come to earth. Jesus' miracles pointed to what was ultimate, God's kingdom. But they were looking for something immediate. They wanted their bellies to be full. And so Jesus says to them, Jesus says to them, or excuse me let, me, let me get to where they go. Then they asked him, okay? They asked him, what must we do to do the work that God requires? So they said, okay, Jesus, if you don't want to feed us, if you don't want to feed us, how about you... Teach us how to do the trick. 
That way we can make our own bread. Hey, Jesus, do you have like those bread makers? Right? So we could just, if you handed out one to everybody and gave us a lifetime supply of flour and whatever else goes into bread, I got to be honest. Right? Could you just do that for us? That way we wouldn't have to bother you anymore. Right? Right? They're, they're, they're kind of saying, it was really cool how you did that with the, you know, the boy, the loaves, the fishes. Can you teach us how to do some of your tricks? And then Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe. Everybody say believe. believe. To believe in the one he sent. See, here's what belief means. It's very important. As a matter of fact, this is really profound, yet simple. Right? Jesus says, believe in the one that God has sent. That's very simple, isn't it? Oh, just believe? But real belief means this. Real belief means that you trust me, and real belief means that you follow me. Now, I could have said to my friend Donnie, all the way back in college, I could have said, yeah, Don, Donnie, I, I believe you, but you know what? I'm going to grab my map to make sure I can get there. You know what? You go ahead. I'll figure it out on my own, right? Does that sound like I really believe him? No. The belief was in the trust. The trust was in the follow. And this is what Jesus is saying. If you really want to do God's will, then you will believe me, but you will believe me when you trust me. You will trust me when you follow. And what Jesus is saying is, I know how to get you there. I know how to get you where you want to go. Now you can imagine these folks did what a lot of us do, right? They try to change tactics. I mean, it can't be that easy. Have you ever talked to someone? It can't be that easy just to believe. It can't be that easy just to accept Christ. It can't be that easy just to follow. There's got to be another way. There's got to be something else I have to do. So they changed tactics and they said this. They said, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you. What will you do? Now we look at this. Now come on. Because I saw a couple of you just snicker. He just fed 5,000 people. Right? He's healing people all over the place. He walked on water. Right? Okay, Jesus. Um, how about you give us a sign? Right? And we look at that and go, no, no, no. Here's what they were really saying. Here's what they were saying. They were really saying, Jesus, you know what? I got this crazy idea. You're not going to believe what just popped into my head. I mean, <sighs> the craziest thing. You ready? Verse 31. Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. See what they're still fixated on? Right? In other words, I just had this crazy idea, Jesus. Why don't you do what you did yesterday? As a matter of fact, we got the boy, right? Let's grab, grab a boy. Does anybody got a boy here, right? Get a couple, right? We want to remanufacture the miracle. Let's see what we can, Jesus, if you could just continue to give us bread. Because that thing you did yesterday, that was a really good one. That, that, that was a good one. We want more bread. Feed us. So here's Jesus' response. Jesus said to them, very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but my Father. Verse 33. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. How many of you have ever watched It's a Wonderful Life? The rest of you are pagans. How do you not watch It's a Wonderful Life? Seriously? There are people who have never seen It's a Wonderful Life? If you're here, you've never seen It's a Wonderful Life. Raise your hand. Get a life. How's that possible? Al, you're like 108 years old. How have you not seen that? You were like alive when it was made. Didn't you take that quarter, that five, that nickel and go to the movie theater? Okay. 
And uh, it's a wonderful life. Do you remember the scene where he is, he's, he's um, opening up the house for a new couple, right? And he has a couple of things in his hand, and one of them is bread. See, because bread was a symbol of life. And Jesus was saying, this bread, this bread that I can offer you, it is eternal. This bread that I can offer you, it lasts forever. And they're like, okay. They, they couldn't hold back anymore, right? And here's what they said in verse 34. Sir, now check out that first word, sir. What did they call him just a couple of verses earlier? Rabbi. Now he's just sir. Catch that? At the beginning, they're buttering him up. Hey, rabbi, powerful man, right? Now it's like, listen, you're not going to give us what, sir, right? Your kids get to that point, right? Sir, they said, always give us this bread. In other words, they're saying, spoil us. Spoil us. You got this bread. It lasts forever. Good. We're your guinea pigs. We're the people you want to. We're the ones who've been following you. We're the ones who've stayed with you. We're the ones that have been there. We're the ones that have been faithful to you. We're the ones who show up every Sunday. We're the ones who come to the cleanup days, October 19th. We're the ones who show up all the time. Spoil us. Give us. Give us. Feed us. Make it rain bread. Just like it happened back for Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. Just let it drop down from heaven. We'll take it just like that. Spoil us. In other words, they're saying, make our life easier. And I could just kind of see Jesus shaking his head. Are you kidding me? How are you not getting this? And so Jesus says this, and you've heard this before. I am the bread of life. I am the the bread of life. And Jesus is saying, all the signs you want, they've all been pointing to me. And what you're looking for isn't a what. What you've been looking for is a who. And I am him. I am he. I'm the one who satisfies. I'm the one you're longing for. I'm the one who knows how to go where you need to go. I know how to get you there. And as you read through, and I'm going to skip some verses here, but as you read through the story, Jesus continues on this track, and they're not getting it. They're not buying it. They don't want it. They just want bread. And it gets even harder, right? Because in this next couple of verses, Jesus says something that we get now, but they didn't get then right? And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, right, I'm the bread of life. I'm the eternal one. I'm the one you're looking for. So here's what you have to do. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they're like, uh, this took a weird turn, right? Could you imagine if somebody was standing, could you imagine if I'm standing here and there's a couple thousand people here and I go, okay, here's what you got to do. You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Right? How many of you would do what the whole bunch of people there did? Ah, this is where we get off. Thank you. This ride's been fun. I'm out. Deuces. (laughs) Right? Like, we are gone. I read this sermon as a pastor, and I'm like, this is not Jesus' best sermon. Like, this was a dud. Right? I've gone home on Sundays and I look at my wife and I go, Yeah, that one stunk. That, that was, yeah, I wish I could have that one back. It sounded a lot better in my head than it did when I got there on Sunday morning. I've had a couple of those. And this is Jesus' like worst sermon. I mean, the people are leaving, right? And they're, they're like out of there. This is not his best sermon. And we get this, okay? We get what Jesus is talking about because what Jesus is talking about is a sign. And it's pointing to later, we get it now. But they're living this in real time. Like he's talking about drinking blood and eating flesh and they're like, exactly like a whole, most of us, if not all of us in this room, they're doing the exact same thing. Like we're out. This guy has clearly lost it. Something's happened, right? 
And I can kind of imagine, it's not written in the scripture, but my imagination runs like this. I could see a couple of Jesus' disciples, probably James because James was his brother, and, and maybe John because, you know, John keeps talking. If you read the book of John, he keeps talking about how much Jesus loved him, right? So I could kind of see James and John coming up to Jesus and going, hey, Jesus, Jesus, come here. Stop talking. You're killing us, bud. This one's not going well. Stop, right? And maybe they, maybe they did something like this. Hey, Matthew, Matthew, you're a tax collector? Come over here. Tell a few tax collector jokes, okay, right? Jesus will be back in a moment, folks, right? And they grab Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, you're killing us here, right? People are leaving. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to do a couple of miracles, right? Give some bread out. You got to turn this thing around. People are leaving. And here's what happens in verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples. Now listen, these aren't the 12, okay? Jesus had many disciples who would follow him around. They weren't the inner circle. They weren't the 12. But there was a lot of disciples who were following Jesus. They had followed the, uh, John the Baptist, and now they were following Jesus. And when Jesus went to different places, they were there. They were, they were that kind of Sunday morning crowd. They, they weren't there all the time, but they showed, they didn't come to men's breakfast yesterday, okay? No, no condemnation, okay? But it was good. It was good, okay? So they're, they're, they're like on the periphery, but they're not in that inner sanctum, okay? So I don't want you to be confused here. So they said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Verse 61. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, now Jesus is talking to the 12. Jesus said to them, or excuse me, this is the bigger crowd, I apologize. Does this offend you? Jesus says to them, stop, 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 before you go, before you go, I'm taking a survey here. Taking a survey. Does this offend you? In other words, here's what Jesus is saying. Does this trip you up? Does this teaching cause you to have second thoughts? Does the, what I'm saying to you cause you to doubt who I am? Does this teaching, does this, does this sermon, does it make you have doubts, second thoughts? Does it cause you to not trust me? Skip down to verse 66. It says this, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Listen, listen. What had happened was they left because he wouldn't give them what they wanted when they wanted it. See, Jesus had met their need the day before. He'd had compassion on them if you read the scripture. He saw that they were weary. He saw that they were hungry. He saw that there was no way for them to get food. And so he met their immediate need. At that point, it was a need. The next day, what was it? It was a want. Give us what we want when we want it. And maybe you're here today and you, are, you can identify with that. Maybe while you were in high school, your parent got sick and you prayed and they died. Maybe you grew up in church and somewhere along the line, a pastor did something, and you were disappointed, and you began to doubt. And you're thinking, it didn't work out the way I thought it would. It didn't go the way I expected. This, this Christianity, this God thing, this, this, it didn't go the way I thought it would. Can I tell you something this morning? I understand that. And your heavenly Father understands that. See, the crowd wanted something that would satisfy them immediately. They wanted something that was temporary and perishable, and that would satisfy them for a few hours. But Jesus was offering them something that was better. Jesus was offering them life. He was offering them real life. What Jesus was offering them was less filling, but more fulfilling. 
Less temporal, more eternal. Less immediate, more life-changing. And so the 12 disciples, they're watching this whole thing. And they begin to panic. They began to worry because the crowd was leaving and they were losing momentum. And here's what that meant. The crowds, if there were large crowds, those that were seeking to arrest Jesus and kill Jesus, they couldn't get to Jesus as long as there was a crowd. There was protection in a crowd. And if that crowd left, that means that they were less protected. And it meant that they were vulnerable. And so you can imagine the disciples are worried about this. And, and not only that, but these were some of their friends that had been there, that had followed, that had, had trusted Christ, that had been there all along and seen these miracles and seen the things that Jesus had done. And, and they had personal relationships with them. And so they're probably looking and they're watching like, uh, there goes Justin. There goes Lucinius. Oh, man, I thought we were going to do this together, guys. I thought we were in this together. And their friends and their protection. Like, we're out. This is too hard. Somewhere along the line, this became difficult. So Jesus senses their fears, and he saw what they saw. And he kind of pauses, and he looks out at the crowds that are dispersing. And he says to the disciples, he says, you. You. And he's talking about the 12 now. You. You. He says, you don't want to leave too, do you? In other words, he was calling them out. Because you got to know those 12 were having doubts too. You got to know that they were thinking, this is weird. I mean, I ain't eating anybody and I ain't drinking any blood. I mean, this just, right? Jesus always explains it to us. So let's hang on because this is going to make sense later, right? But deep down, somewhere, you got to believe that those 12 are like, this is, this is getting weird and dangerous now. And so, kind of, you could kind of see everybody kind of looking down at their feet. Nobody's making eye contact as Jesus is calling them out, right? And then Peter. Peter saw what they missed. Peter saw what we miss. And Peter saw what I hope some of you are going to see today. In verse 68, he says this. Lord, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? And what Peter's saying is, he says, we don't know how to get there. And Jesus, if I'm really honest, we don't even know where there is most of the time. We don't even know where there, we don't know what you're talking about, where we're going. We just, we're kind of lost here. And yeah, it's about to get difficult, yet moving in a different direction doesn't guarantee a better destination. And Peter was saying this. Peter was saying, Jesus, if not you, who? Jesus, if not you, who? And then he says this. Besides, you have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. And here's what, Jesus, uh, what Peter is saying. He says, before you, Jesus, there was fishing, there was family, there was marriage, there was children, and there was death. And Jesus, you have invited us into something much bigger. Jesus, you've given our lives purpose, and you've given purpose to our lives. Jesus, we now have somewhere to go. Jesus, we now understand the destiny and the direction of our life. I want you to ask yourself this question today. Because you're going somewhere even if you don't know where. And you know what? You're following someone even if you don't know who. So I want you to ask yourself this question today. To whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? And as I read this story this week and I began to prepare for this morning, I began to think about my unfollow moment. My unfollow moment came the summer before I went to Bible college. I had a lot of doubts and a lot of fears. And I was overwhelmed with anxiety 
about the next steps of my life. Here's the deal. I'd grown up in church and Christianity had served me well. But to pursue this life as a career was a big step. I mean, to be a pastor of, uh, and make this not just a calling and not just a Sunday morning thing, but all of my life, it meant that my marriage options became smaller. I mean, who wants to marry a pastor, right? And it meant that my wife is going to be a pastor's wife. So, you know, I mean, like how many people are signing up for that, right? It also meant that my kids would be preacher's kids. And I grew up a preacher's kid, right? I had seen how people had abused and, and did things to my parents. And I'd seen the hardship in their life. I got to be honest, if I had known all of you would be here, I would have signed up for it in a moment. I'd be like, that's, I'm in. I'm in. But that summer before I went off to Bible college, I had a lot of doubts. And I want you to know this. If you decide to follow Jesus, there's no guarantee that everything will be easy. Scripture says the exact opposite. To count the cost. Doesn't mean that it's easy. But you have to believe that Jesus is going to lead you where you need to be. And that he knows how to get you there. And Christ's offer to follow him and his invitation to follow you, him is not the promise of a happy ending. Christ's promise is the promise of a promising and purposeful life. And a purposeful ending. And that you can look back on your life and say, God made my life have purpose and meaning. And the direction that he has taken me is the best direction for my life. So I will ask you this morning, if not him, who? See, I realized something. I realized I was going to follow someone. And I realized that I was going to end up somewhere. And besides, to be honest with you, I had seen too much. I had seen God's faithfulness. And I had seen how God brings purpose to life. And I had seen how those who do not have God don't have purpose to life. And I had also seen how people without God lived And I had seen and I had watched and I observed rich, successful people without God. And I had seen enough to know that there isn't enough money and there isn't enough things and there isn't enough stuff and there isn't enough success that leads to inward peace and fulfillment. And here's what I decided. I decided to pick up all my fears and all my doubts and I realized To whom shall I go? Would you say this with me out loud this morning? To whom shall I go? Let's all say it together. To whom shall I go? You know what's comforting to me? What's comforting to me is that these guys who were eyewitnesses, they watched Jesus perform miracles. They saw Jesus heal people. By the time of this story, he had raised people from the dead. They had seen all that Jesus had done. And they still had doubts. And so, I'm here to tell you that I'm glad I picked up all my fears and my doubts. I'm glad that I decided to follow him. And here's what I know from my experience that you'll be glad to. He will make your life better because he'll make you better at life. And here's the great thing. We've had a lot of bad theology for a long time, right? We used to sing songs like this. I got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. That's horrible theology. Nice song. Bad theology. First of all, Scripture never talks about mansions. Okay? That's a bad translation. Talks about rooms in our Father's house. Listen, you want a mansion? You have a mansion all you want. I'd rather be in Father's house. 
Amen? That's a proper scripture there. But more importantly, we have this idea that eternal life happens when we die. Can I tell you something? That eternal life starts today. Now. We don't have this promise that we're going to die one day and walk into the presence of God. We have this promise that the presence of God resides within us. Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. So we don't just step one day, we die, and we all of a sudden, if we're walking with God, and we're spending time with God, the beauty of it is, is that eternal life starts now, today. And it changes everything in our lives. It changes how we view our money. It changes how we view our time. It changes how we view our talent. We become generous with those things when we become followers of Christ because, you know what? They're gifts from God that we are. And so I say again to you this morning that following Jesus is not easy. It's not easy. But can I tell you what? So what? Life's not easy. Life's not easy. We go through the same things that everybody else goes through. Our cars break down, right? We lose loved ones. We, we have difficulties. There's layoffs in jobs. Life isn't easy. The question really comes down to this. What direction am I heading when those, t- those trials and those tough times come? Because if I, I don't know the direction and I don't know the destination and I don't trust who I'm following, then I just go through life with this meaningless, endless, not knowing. But when I follow Christ and those tough times come, I recognize that God works all things together for good. And that, yeah, it's not easy, and yes, it's hard, but you know what? It's going to be all right because the God who holds all things in his hands is directing my destination and my life. So yeah, following Jesus isn't easy. But can I tell you something? Following Jesus is better. Following Jesus is better. And I'll tell you why. Because he knows where he's going, and he knows where you're going, and he knows where you need to be. Let me say that again. He knows where he's going. He knows where you're going, and he knows where you need to be. He has the words of eternal life. Nobody else is offering that. Nobody else is offering that. And you may be thinking, why should I believe all this? Maybe you're sitting there and you're working through this in your mind. You go, okay, 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 okay. Book written 2,000 years ago about some guy who died on a cross and who was raised to life. Why should I believe all of this? Why should I believe that my life would be better if I surrendered everything? I'm not talking about surrendering part. I'm not talking about becoming part of a religion. I'm not talking about you're going to show up on Sunday mornings That's all the outgrowth of of surrendering everything. I'm talking about surrendering. Today, I surrender all of it to Jesus. Why should I do that? Well, here's what stands out to me. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter, Paul. All these patriarchs in the Bible, they all testify that Jesus rose from the dead. Not that Jesus died. A lot of people stop there. Who cares if Jesus died? Who cares if Jesus, honestly, who cares if Jesus, everybody dies. The only way that Jesus could be who he claimed to be was that he rose from the dead. And we have all these eyewitnesses that testify. John writes this from first person. Listen, you can argue with anything else you want, but you can't argue with someone's story. John said, I was there. I touched him. I spoke with him. I watched him die, and I was there. I saw him after he rose from the dead. I can only tell you my story. And listen, he 
held to that story. They all held to that story. All of them died on account and none of them recanted. So I can tell you is that eyewitnesses all proclaim that Jesus did exactly what he said he would do. He rose from the dead to certify his claim, right? That he knows where he's going. He knows where you're going and he knows how to get you there. So my question to you to you today is this. Will you choose to follow Jesus? Will you choose to surrender to his direction? In other words, not my way, your way. Not my will, your will. Will you surrender to his direction and will you trust him with your destination? Will you trust him with your destination? Will you trust him with your marriage? Will you trust Him with your time, with your relationships, with your academics? Will you trust Him in every area of your life? That's the invitation today. So I've asked Bud and Lauren to come. I'd like for everybody to stand, and I'm going to ask us to just put our lights back to... We're going to sing one verse in chorus of this song, and then I'm going to come back. I'm going to give you an opportunity. I want you to... As we sing this last song, I want you to pray. Pray through your feelings right now and pray this. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to lead us all in just a simple prayer. I'm going to give you some direction this morning, but it's simply this. You're just praying as we're singing and maybe you're singing and praying, but you're just praying, God, I want to trust you. God, I want you to determine the destination of my life. Because my intentions are good, but my direction isn't leading where I want to end up. And so today I'm willing to surrender to your direction so I can get at the desired destination. Lord, I'm going to ask everybody to join in this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died and you rose from the dead to clarify that you are who you claim to be. And based on that, I have decided to follow you. I've decided to give you my destination and to trust you that you know where to go. I determine today and I proclaim today that I'm going to follow you. I thank you that you died so that I could have eternal life. And I declare today that I trust you with every facet of my life. Amen.